Well, and here's the thing, right? A lot of people listening, the, the vast majority of people on earth right now do not have the knowledge that you have. So to you, I feel like the, the science becomes a little more clear, right? The mathematics, these things. But I think this is why people write it off. I, I think this is why people aren't as amazed because it's easy for us uneducated to say, well, you know, Avi mentioned that we don't know what it is, but isn't it more plausible that because the, you know, space is so large, it's not that it's extraterrestrial. It's just, uh, you know, space rock that we haven't encountered yet because there's so much of it. Well, but uh, the thing is, if you look at the numbers, that in fact, for every star, you need uh, 10 to the power 22 such objects to be ejected, like the meteor, for example, or uh, in terms of Oumuamua-like objects, you need 10 to the power 15 of those to exist right now within the solar system. We saw that just the one that came close to us, but you just do the math of the statistics, you know, random mm -hmm. statistics of objects, mm -hmm. and you find there is a huge number of these things. And it's really challenging to explain it because, you know, I wrote uh, the first paper a decade before Oumuamua was discovered, mm -hmm. uh, forecasting how many rocks we should expect from other stars, just based on what we know about the solar system. And we, we calculated that the, this telescope in Hawaii should see nothing because there aren't enough of them. Then Oumuamua was a surprise. It shows that my calculation was wrong. I was intrigued because mm -hmm. there is an opportunity to learn something new. But the challenge is still there. How do you make so many rocks per star? Much more than you, know, you expect from knowing the solar system. And um, if you want an, a natural explanation, it needs to be very common. This process that makes them, this uh, factory that makes these objects, uh, needs to make m many more than we expect based on what we know about the solar system by f mm. at least a factor of a hundred. This discrepancy remains, even if you make it natural. Moreover, it didn't show a cometary tail and you need to explain why it was pushed away from the sun. So people talk about a nitrogen iceberg, a hydrogen iceberg, uh, or a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles. All of these suggestions have difficulties explaining the detailed properties of Oumuamua. In the, with respect to the meteor, we've never seen anything like it. So the experts, quote unquote, these are playing the adults in the room, so to speak. <laughs> I'm the kid saying, look, there is something strange here. And they say, no, no, no. Actually, we can uh, explain it. It's just that the data is wrong. So they say the data by the U.S. Space Command, which monitors for ballistic missiles, uh, was measuring the speed uh, incorrectly and it's a factor of three smaller speed and then it's a stone that is actually bound to the sun that appeared in a scientific paper published in the astrophysical journal just last month and wow. the, for them to say that the u.s government doesn't know what they are talking about when they deal with uh, you know the satellite data that they obtain and actually the u.s space command wrote a letter to nasa uh, last uh, last year confirming at the 99.999 percent confidence that indeed this object, this meteor, is interstellar in origin. So they, you know, uh, took some time out of their day job, which is national security, to help uh, blue sky research. And basically, the Department of Defense came to my defense, wrote a formal letter to NASA. And now, a year later, these astronomers say, oh, we don't believe the U.S. government. They made a mistake by a factor of three. And my, my point is, if you believe that, as an astronomer, that they made a mistake by a factor of three, they did, didn't measure the speed correctly, how can you sleep well at night? Because right. they are getting more, bad, more money than NASA mm -hmm. to look for ballistic missiles and advise the U.S. president. If they see measure the speed of a ballistic missile incorrectly by a factor of three, they might warn Mexico for something right. heading their way when it's heading to Washington, D.C. It's as if they don't know what they're talking about. And... Uh, the other thing is, I went there, okay? So I organized an expedition for one and a half million dollars with 28 exceptional uh, professionals that came with me, the best in the world for ocean expeditions. We went to the site of the meteor that the U.S. government pointed to, uh, and uh, we searched for any molten droplets from the surface of the meteor when it exploded the, after it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that it created as a result of the friction with air. And, you know, we were looking for droplets the size of a millimeter, the head of a pin. 
across mm. a region that is seven miles in size, 10 kilometers. Uh, that was the region. And um, the depth of the ocean was roughly a mile over there. And just think about it, looking for tiny droplets the size of a grain of sand mm -hmm. at a depth of uh, a mile across the region of seven miles. That sounds like a hopeless uh, mission. Sure uh, does. <laughs> and, but the amazing thing is we found it. We found by now uh, more than 700 such droplets. Moreover, <laughs> we analyzed the composition of those here at Harvard University. I cannot speak about the details. They will come out uh, after your broadcast airs a few days later sure. uh, in a scientific paper uh, that will be shared by, with everyone. Uh, and uh, we are basically addressing the question, can we tell from the composition, just the elements that make up the droplets that came from this meteor? They were concentrated along the path of the meteor. There were, uh, there were more spheros, more of these droplets, near the meteor path than far away. We checked that. We mm -hmm. looked at control regions. Anyway, the ones, the excess spheros from the meteor, uh, the question is, do they have a composition that uh, is different from solar system materials? Because the entire solar system was made out of a cloud of gas that was enriched with the same abundances of different elements. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we look at material that came from a completely different region in the Milky Way galaxy, you know, it had very different abundances because those abundances come from an exploding star in the vicinity of the region where it's come. So we can tell the fingerprints of foreign material, material that is, doesn't belong to the solar system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have results that uh, would ad address the question independent of the velocity measurement by the U.S. Space Command. Forget about that. Just the composition mm -hmm. itself is a fingerprint. And then uh, beyond that, this, the next question is, given the composition, could it be technological in origin? Because right. if you imagine a Voyager melting off in a fireball by, by colliding with an Earth-like planet, like let's say a billion years from now it exits the solar system and then it's not operating anymore, but then it collides with another planet like the Earth and burns up like a meteor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that case, if there is a curious scientist on that planet that will go there and to the ocean and collect the, the spherules, uh, they might find that uh, indeed it's not uh, made, it's not a rock. Uh, it would have a higher material strength, obviously, and will have uh, a composition, let's say, of stainless steel, which is very different than a rock. Uh, just imagine melting uh, computer screens or sure. semiconductors. They would have different composition of rare elements. So that's what we are addressing in this paper that will come soon, uh, come out. And my point is, you know... <laughs> Seeking the evidence. First of all, it was a risky uh, project to take because it's very challenging to find those things. Mm -hmm. But without searching, you obviously will not, never find anything. And right. if you have a prejudice, you might not want to search because you want your prejudice to be valid. And uh, obviously, that's what the people who believe that everything in the sky is stones. You know, mm -hmm. they wanted the the government data not to uh, to be wrong, and they wanted me not to go there because there is no chance of finding anything. So I didn't listen to them. I'm right. not subscribed to social media. I don't care how many likes I have. Sure. I just went there. Then getting the team to collect the, the spheros by itself was an extremely risky thing, right? Yeah. And, I mean, getting it funded at one and a half million dollars, it's not a trivial thing. I didn't fundraise and someone came to me, um, Charles Hoskinson, and provided the funds. Mm -hmm. So And then bringing the material back and finding 700, more than 700 spherules was not an easy task. Sure. And then analyzing them with the best instruments in the world. You know, that's something I, you know, I didn't know what the outcome would be, whether it will be possible. So there were lots of failure points, potential failure points along the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can all celebrate the fact that, that we got to the point where we have results and data and I can share them with the world. And uh, to me, it's a triumph of also, uh, you know, uh, sticking to um, a risky uh, approach to doing science rather yeah. than uh, insisting that everything we know already must be right. You know, right. Like, and, uh, in the, you know, to me, that's the, the whole meaning of my life to learn something new. You can't learn something new if you insist that we know already everything which right. is pretty much what the experts are doing. You know, I, I would agree with you. I've said this on the podcast. 
the experts, I mean, we've interviewed over 400 in different fields. And the ones who say things with entire certainty are the ones that I tend to trust the least because um, it's just something I've learned. The people who really are at the top of their game, they always caveat things. They'll say, to the best of our knowledge, with our current data, the research right. shows. It's a and sense so it's of modesty, a... by the way. It's also, it reflects modesty, humility. You, 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 you have to acknowledge that your knowledge is incomplete. You, are mm -hmm. not, you make mistakes. You know, science is about making mistakes. Right. And when, when, I, when I was young, the, the most uh, frustrating experience I had was at the dinner table when I would ask a difficult question and the adults in the room would pretend that they know the answer or they would dismiss the question if they have no idea. And right. to me, that was very frustrating, you know, people pretending. And of course, uh, the problem is when people become adults from being children because then they learn how to fake it. Yeah. They yeah. pretend as if they know something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 